Um, I believe that's everything from the Writer Center. I'm just so happy to be here and so happy that all of you have come out too. So uh, I'd like to introduce now Donnie Hemans, the owner of uh, the DC Writers Room to introduce this event. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Zach, and thanks everyone um, for coming. So first of all, I wanna say thanks to the Writers Center for again hosting the DC Writers Room for this, um, our second um, conversation in the Unbound series. Um, and so if you have not heard about us, the DC Writers Room is a co-working studio for writers based in Tenley Town. And um, what we offer is, is just really simple. We offer a quiet studio to work and to escape the distractions that often get in the way of any kind of writing that you want to do. And you can learn more about us at um, dcwritersroom.com. So I'm happy to have two of our members in conversation today. Eric Weiner is an award-winning journalist and the author of several books, including um, the Geography of Bliss, The Geography of Genius, The Spiritual Memoir, Man Seeks God, and his latest book, which he'll be talking about today, is The Socrates Express. Eric is also a former foreign correspondent for NPR and a reporter for The New York Times. These days, he contributes regularly to The Washington Post and BBC Travel and other publications. And so our moderator this evening is Peter Copeland, who is also a journalist an author and consultant to media companies and news organizations. He served um, in an earlier part of his life, he served as the Washington Bureau Chief of the EW Scripps Company and editor and general manager of Scripps Howard News Service. And as a journalist, he covered Latin America, the Pentagon, the US invasion of Panama, the Gulf War, the intervention in Somalia and so much more. And he has also published five books. And so, as Zach said, we um, welcome your questions. So just let us know in the chat what you would like um, Eric to also cover. And so, Peter, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you, Donna. And uh, thank you to the DC Writers Room at where Eric and I work. And uh, thank you to the Writers Center also. Um, Eric Weiner has written a very insightful, fun, and helpful book that defies categories. Um, I've heard it referred to as a travel book. It's also a book about philosophy. It's a memoir and it's a kind of self-help book. My own copy, which I have here, is uh, very well marked with thoughts from the great philosophers he covers and also with a lot of uh, insights from Eric himself. So we're gonna talk about the book for 45 minutes. First, we're gonna talk about the book and writing then the philosophies that are discussed in the book, and then how writers and artists can use philosophy in our own lives and our work. And then at the end, we're gonna do a lightning round. This is the first time I've ever tried this, where we're gonna pit some of our problems, our life problems against philosophy's answers and Eric's talent. So here we go. So Eric, you've mastered the storytelling process in newspapers first and then radio and now books. It's, it's unusual that um, you really mastered those three things among other things in your life, but do you, do you think of books as the, the highest form of storytelling or another kind of storytelling or how, where do you put books in that? Uh, I'm gonna put it at the top, <laughs> if I can do that. Um, I think um, in, in a way, uh, writing a book is like doing a New York Times story and an NPR story plus. Um, and, you know, writing a, a newspaper story requires marshalling the facts and, and the anecdotes and everything you need. Um, writing for an, an NPR script really taught me how to get to the point, to, to get to the essence of what it is I was writing back about. Because when you're listening to the radio, unlike reading a book, you can't flip back and see what was just said. So that actually made me uh, write for the ear, learn how to write for the ear, um, but uh, a book is still, I think, the best technology, and it is a technology. Even a, even a hardbound book is a piece of technology. Um, and the best format for we still have for going into some depth into a subject. Um, and a book can skim on the surface or can dive deep into, you know, John McPhee wrote a book about oranges called Oranges, I think. You know, there's a book about the history of the pencil. A book can be anything uh, and everything. So I'm going to give the book the highest, uh, on my hierarchy of uh, 
artistic endeavors, I'll put the book at the top. Okay. Um, I'm guessing that there are a fair number of writers that are on the call. So I, I'm going to ask a couple of book questions. You structured it around train travel. And you could have you could have done anything in a philosophy book. Why, why, why did you pick train travel? Because I like trains and I like travel. <laughs> and I really like train travel. Um, I, I'm a place person. You know, I, I, when I think of an idea, and I don't think of a who or a what. I think of a where first. I need to have a where. I need to have a place. And you need to get to places. And you can get to places on a bus or an airplane, but I cannot think on a bus, and I cannot think on an airplane. Um, and I defy anyone to actually think in those two modes of transport. But there's something about trains that's just conducive to contemplation and thought. Um, little trail outside of London that J.K. Rowling was on when she dreamed up the, the boy wizard. So um, it gave the book some structure. It gave me literally a vehicle to go from point A to point B, and it just lends itself to, to contemplation. And one of the fun things that you did is you, there are really two characters in the book, besides the philosophers, you and your daughter. And my dog. Don't forget that my, my dog makes a cameo appearance. Um, he, would, he would be in front of you. But you're right. My daughter gets a uh, full-fledged supporting character in, in the book. And is she okay with that? <laughs> Define okay. <laughs> she still lives at home? Uh, she's 15 years old now. She was 13 at the time. And it's funny, when she was 13, I said, so you're going to be in my book. You're, she's like, yeah, 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 book, whatever. And then, now she's 15 when the book comes out, and she realizes oh, that her you know, friends read books and that she's in it. And, um, and even the Washington Post Review mentioned, made mention of her. So she's, I'll be honest, she's a little peeved, and she's a little honored. Uh, I'm not sure where the balance is. Um, but, um, yeah, she, she was my foil, um, the one who brought me down to earth. I mean, Socrates thought that philosophy should be practiced in the buddy system, that you need someone to keep you on track, and that's, what, that's her role. It's nice. I think it's nice how you did it. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, if, do, do you. When you write a book, do you have a target person in mind? Is it? Yes, uh, the target person is me, basically. Um, I, I, I don't believe in writing for the reader. I think, um, you know, that sort of philosophy may work in sales if you're, you know, working at a grocery store and you need packaging that targets the consumer, whatever it is. I think um, every writer writes for themselves first and foremost, but being a human being and a sentient being like others, um, if we write for ourselves, we are writing for others at the same time. So um, I, I will say it, who my target audience is not, which is professional philosophers. This is not a book for uh, professors of philosophy, although I've heard from some who bless them say good job, uh, which is high praise. Um, but, you know, you, it, it's not for experts, and I really don't think that philosophy should be the domain of experts exclusively, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book in the first place. I think it's encouraging, though, that um, for those of us that are trying to write books, that you you stayed true to what you wanted to do, and you were commercially successful. Um, I checked this morning, and you're number one in Amazon. Uh, it seems like the book is doing great, so congratulations. Well, not number one for all books. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> You have okay. on the Amazon bestseller list for philosophy books. So correct. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll take it. And if yeah, I, I I do believe that you um. I talk about not writing for the reader, and you shouldn't write for the um. You shouldn't write for your publisher. Well, you write for your publisher, but you shouldn't. You should you you should stay true to your vision for the book, and um, hopefully the sales will come along as well. I, I think of you uh, as a reporter in a way in that you, you went out to see the philosophers. You didn't stay home and read the books. You, you went out to where they lived. Um, have you ever, um, have you thought about writing fiction ever? Or do you think your, your future books will be nonfiction also? I think they'll be nonfiction mainly because of my indecisiveness. And maybe the fiction writers will have an answer to this, but 
um, if I'm on a train in, uh, you know, somewhere in Switzerland, um, you know, the Alps look a certain way, um, and the conductor's wearing either a brown or a green pair of pants. Um, but if I could describe the Alps anyway, and the conductor's pants in any color, I think I would get uh, lost in indecisiveness. So um, I find that this sort of creative nonfiction is sort of the best of both worlds. You, you have a set of facts and observations that sort of guide you along, like a train on the tracks, if you will. But along the way, you're free to have flights of fancy about what those observations mean. And for me, that's, that's the sweet spot. You never know, never say never, but for now, I think that's, that's my genre. OK. Um, all right, so I want to switch a little bit into the philosophy itself and the, and the philosophers that you talked about. Um, I don't, I don't know anything about philosophy. I'm guessing most of the people that pick up the book, they know a little bit, not much. Tell us, is philosophy like religion or is it, how is it different? Philosophy is more like, ironically, writing fiction um, in a way. Um, we're just talking about that. What I mean by that is, uh, someone once described Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, in saying that you shouldn't read him as a, uh, philosophy per se, but it's life enhancing poetry. And I quite like that. I think it implies applies to all great philosophers and really my approach to philosophy is life enhancing poetry. Now poetry is not true in the sense that scientific facts are true, but it can certainly be subjectively true and it has its own kind of truth. And um, philosophy for me is the same way. Just say if you put down a good book of poetry or a good novel, uh, it stays with you for a while. And it's like wearing a pair of glasses. You see the world in a certain way. So too with philosophy. If you're reading a good piece of philosophy or pondering it or doing philosophy yourself, ideally, you see the world a bit differently. Uh, it, it is a life-enhancing poetry. Um, that, that, you know, that's, that's my approach to philosophy. I think it's in line with what the ancient Greeks had in mind in the beginning. You know, philosophy comes from the ancient Greek is you probably know by now, if you read the book, uh, philosophia, which means literally love of wisdom and a philosopher, is someone who loves wisdom. It's that simple. And I, I think it's, um, I hope my book in some small way helps philosophy return to its core mission, as they say in the business world. But I, I like also the enhancing part of it, that there, there is an element of self-help and self-knowledge, self-improvement in and at least in the philosophies that you talked about. Yes, and I think that's, again, how it started. It was, you know, if you joined Plato's Academy or um, uh, Aristotle's school, the Peripatetic school, or, or Epicurus's crazy commune garden, you were signing up for a full-on life improvement session. It would be like going to, uh, I would say, like a rehab spa or going to a... Um, it was sort of everything rolled into one. It was physical exercise. It was learning about uh, nature and about science. But it was primarily about how to live a good life with a capital G, you know, how, how to live a richer, more meaningful life. And if, if that's self-help, great. That's, that's how it began. And um, so and I don't think I'm inventing anything entirely new with philosophy. I'm, again, trying to return it to where it started. So just for those of you that have not had a chance to read Socrates Express yet, uh, Eric takes, right, on, available wherever books are sold. Yeah. Um, he takes 14 philosophers, and they, they're mostly European, but there's one from China, one from Japan, one from India, three women in the group. Um, how did you, you, how many did you have when you first sat down with the notebook and, and made a list? Uh, many more. Uh, <laughs> I, had, I mean, I, I had dozens and dozens. And if you Google philosopher, you'll get hundreds or thousands of names. Um, so I narrowed it down. There were 15, actually, when I started writing and uh, doing the research, but one um, met with an unfortunate demise and did not make the cut. Um, I can tell you, that was Kierkegaard. The Danish philosopher was in there, even went to Copenhagen, but he wasn't working for me. Yeah. Um, and I think you should always leave something on the cutting room floor, or in this case, someone on the cutting room floor. And, um, I, you know, I, this is a, every book is personal. Every, every book is incomplete. 
You know, they, they say a, a, good, a piece of writing is never finished, only abandoned. So these are philosophers who spoke to me. These are people I wanted to hang with, right? I had to spend many, many months with each one of them, reading them, learning about them, visiting where they were born, and I had to like them. And I can say, without exception, I like each and every one of them, not equally, you know. Um, Do you have a but favorite? I like, uh, well, that's like asking for your favorite child. But uh, I, would say, I would say two that speak to me the most, and I've really only just come to realize this in talking about the book. I didn't realize it necessarily when I wrote it, are Gandhi, who I've studied for a lifetime and who I'm very fond of, uh, and Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, mm -hmm. uh, it was the last chapter in the book, How to Die, uh, like Montaigne. Because I just think he, he was you know, the French essayist who invented the genre of essays in the 16th century. And I found him just relatable because he wrote about everything. He wrote about thumbs and he wrote about war and he wrote about cannibals and he wrote about loving and everything. And, at, at, you know, the essays are long, a good, you know, 800 pages. And as he goes along, he sort of builds up his confidence in his own voice. So he starts off a bit hesitant and builds it up. And over the arc of my career, you know, I started out as a just the facts uh, journalist and have increasingly grown confident in my own voice. So I, uh, I probably Montaigne's the philosopher I'd most want to have a beer with. Gandhi too, but he didn't drink, so that, was, that wouldn't work. And do you think that your your choice, if you had been a twenty five year old man? would have been different? That's a good question. Wow. Um, unfortunately, when I was a 25 year old man, I wasn't thinking about these questions. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I wish, you know, I had started earlier in the readings and, and on the philosophy. Um, um, I don't know. You know, the book is organized in three sections, uh, dawn, noon, and dusk, um, representing the arc of a day and the arc of a lifetime. So there are questions that are more relevant to a 25-year-old than a 75-year-old. Um, some quite obvious, like how to grow old, but which is in there in the book, but also how to have no regrets, um, how to cope with setbacks and hardship. 25-year-olds aren't really thinking usually about hardships and setbacks. Um, but there, that's the beauty of philosophy is there's a different school and a different vision for each stage of life, for each kind of person. Um, you can mix and match in a way, in a way that you can't really with religion without getting into trouble, at least with some of them. So when we were reporters, we were looking for facts. You, you set out looking for something deeper, I think. Um, you talk about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yes, uh, we confuse them. We actually confuse information and knowledge, knowledge and wisdom. Right. But let's say not knowledge and wisdom. I mean, this, this contraption here is it's an iPhone. Yeah. Um, it has lots of information, and it probably has lots of knowledge. I could go into Wikipedia or any number of sites and find information, knowledge about everything from you know, ancient Egyptians to theoretical physics. But it doesn't have any wisdom. I've tried. Siri is knowledgeable. Siri is not wise. You know, I mean, you can ask Siri, you know, where's the best burrito in Silver Spring? And she can uh, tell you which one gets the most reviews. But if you say, okay, I'm eating this burrito, how can I derive the most pleasure from it? You know, um, she's really going to be at a loss there. Um, you know, there, there's a pithy little quote from a Brit, of course, uh, named Miles Kington. Uh, he was a journalist and a musician. He said, knowledge is knowing that the tomato is a fruit, wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad, um, which is a little cute, um, but also true. Uh, knowledge is a what, it's an accumulation, it's like something you possess, while well, wisdom is a how, it's something you do. So wisdom is not, it's not on a continuum, I really think it's different. It's not like you get more and more and more knowledgeable and then ultimately you become wise. I mean, you've probably met people who know a lot but really aren't wise. Um, and in fact, knowledge can get in the way and you can know too much and it can trip you up. And um, that was really how Socrates began with that, that um, really kind of at the time and still a bit of a thunderbolt observation that we don't, we don't know what we don't know. Um, one of the other things that um, 
Well, that I mentioned about how you, you went out and reported the story. One of the fun things in the book is your visit to Stoic Camp. Can you talk about that? Well, Stoic Camp, need I say more if you're a writer <laughs> and you're writing about philosophy, you see the word Stoic Camp, which I saw in this little ad somewhere, a black and white ad, come to Stoic Camp in Wyoming and achieve tranquility. Um, you know, the Stoics have a, a, a phrase to live in accord with nature, so I thought that made sense. And it just seemed I wanted as a writer to mix it up in that I had gone to Athens for Socrates and Epicurus, and I had gone to Frankfurt, Germany for Schopenhauer and Switzerland for Nietzsche. Um, but for Stoicism, I thought, you know, the whole, my, the whole idea behind this book is that this wisdom in these pages right here are portable, right? Unlike ancient Greek technology or ancient Greek pharmacology, which you don't want to, you don't go to the pharmacist and, say, pharmacist and say, give me that stuff they were taking in 2000 BC in Athens. It, it, we, we have that knowledge has been superseded. But when it comes to wisdom, it is portable. And so you don't need to be in Rome, where Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and Stoic lived, to be a Stoic. You can be in Wyoming. So Stoic camp was started by a philosophy professor named Rob Coulter, uh, who is a great guy, uh, looks like a sort of hipster Santa Claus with a paunch and a gray beard and a twinkle in his eye. And uh, he thought, you know, Stoicism is all about living in accord with nature and roughing it and learning how to cope with hardship. Well, here in Wyoming, we've got nature and hardship, so let's have Stoic camp. And we, me and a bunch of other campers sat around, thought about Stoicism, read about it, and um, uh, did not complain. At least the others did not complain. I, I, is it Spartan? Is our Stoic Spartans? You know what? They are not masochists in that way. Um, they do believe in uh, voluntary deprivation, they call it, as opposed to involuntary deprivation that most writers practice. Uh, but voluntary <laughs> deprivation is occasionally, and this is started by Seneca, who was the richest man in Rome and probably the richest man in the world at the time. He thought every once in a while you should go without something. Um, like if it's the summer and you have an air-conditioned car, for a day or two, turn the air conditioning off and sweat and have your skin stick to the seat so you remember a you remember what the, the and appreciate the air conditioning and b when your air conditioning dies and you don't have it anymore you'll be prepared for it so they're not masochists but they do believe boy this is tough to sum up in a nutshell here but in a, in a nutshell they think that we we have much more control over how we react to deprivation and adversity than we think we do and you know that's you can, as you can imagine, Stoicism is particularly helpful philosophy. It has been for me for the past six months. Okay, so that, let's let's talk about the the writing process and the artistic process, the creative process, and philosophy. Uh, what what can a writer or an artist gain from studying philosophy? Oh boy, um, I think that philosophy. Doing philosophy and doing writing are actually similar in a lot of ways. When you're writing and writing in, in the groove, you are thinking, right? It's not some people, non-writers think you, you think out all your ideas and then you put them down on the page. And as you know, it doesn't work that way. There's sort of their co both are happening simultaneously. As you're writing, uh, you're thinking. As you're thinking, you're writing. And Philosophy, unlike other fields, is not a, just a recitation of memorized facts or bodies of knowledge. It's a process like writing. It sort of unfolds as you do it. Um, like I'm talking to you now, and um, I have not really contemplated this question, but I am now, and in real time, I'm sort of thinking it through, and you might come back and ask another question, and we'd be engaged in it back and forth. Um, and I think good writers also sort of do that with themselves. They sort of have a conversation with themselves as they write. And good philosophy is also a, a conversation with yourself. I think, um, it, so again, the book, uh, and you, you can see my copy is, is marked up. Um, because I was looking for those bits of wisdom that I could then underline and then take. But you talk in the book about how 
you can't have another person's insight. That right. I, I use a just colorful description. It's like wearing someone else's underwear. Yeah, it's just icky. Doesn't fit. Um, it's wrong. This is wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, and that that is uh, something I wrestle with because um, you know I do read these philosophers, so I am I would say borrowing or, or using their idea. I would say digesting their ideas, right? So then it. it it becomes part of you. That that's the idea. It's not that you ignore all this great wisdom out there, but you have to internalize it. And um, and you know, even back in the 19th century, Schopenhauer uh, basically predicted the rise of the internet age and social media by warning people to put down the book every once in a while and and just be with their own thoughts. And if you can just look it up in a book, he said, that's not nearly as good as thinking it through yourself. And now, of course, we don't have to look it up in books. We can Google it or Siri it. And I'm sure Schopenhauer, if you were to pop into the year 2020, well, he would probably say, I chose the wrong year. But then he would say, he would probably say, uh, oh, they're just, they're doing the same thing I warned about only times a thousand. And so, so talk about how, how does that relate to originality, to, um, you know. So, um, there was um, uh, a great um, historian uh, whose name is uh, Will Durant. There it is. Flip my mind when he came back. Will Durant, great historian. And he once said, and he read a lot of history and wrote a lot of history, he said, nothing is new but the arranging. And uh, at first I did not like that quote. I thought, man. It's nothing new but the arranging. Um, why bother writing a book if you're just, you know, arranging words in new ways? But in fact, he was arguing, and I've come around to this view, that, you know, that that is where the creativity lies, in, in not in discovering something entirely new, an entirely new genre, but in arranging things in new ways, in, in your own voice. And uh, to me, that's the originality, um, is convey for me in this book conveying these philosophical ideas but with my sense of humor my style with my voice with my lived experience through the eyes of my daughter and my dog parker um and i think writers get tripped up when they think that what they're writing has to be entirely original like that is who can do that you know i mean even the greatest writers were still standing on the shoulders of giants so why pretend that you don't have shoulders to stand on when you do? Is there a patron philosopher of artists and writers? Oh, boy. Um, Aristotle on rhetoric. Um, boy, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, Grumpy Schopenhauer, we can talk about him in a bit, but he, um, he it's an unusual choice, but I'm going to go with Schopenhauer. Because he, he thought the world was a pretty uh, awful place, you know. Um, basically, we're living, living in the worst of all possible worlds, is what he concluded through a thousand pages of metaphysics. But he thought that art offered uh, an escape from that world uh, for a while and a sort of clarity. And um, he actually put music at the top of the hierarchy, but he loved theater and he loved writing of course and he was actually a great writer um so i would actually go with grumpy schopenhauer but i'm probably missing out um because they all were artistic in their own way no matter how rigorous and academic they were they had that sort of writer's flair to artist flair for for arranging things in new ways and something I've wondered about my whole career, um, is it better, do you think, to reach one person deeply with your work or many people lightly? But how, is that a calculation that a philosopher I guess, would uh, make? I guess reaching many people deeply is not an option. Um, I would say, <laughs> um, look, I'll, I'll talk personally about my, you know, as I said, if, if I say in the book, if, philosophy is not personal, what good is it? That's my feeling. Um, 
I uh, worked at NPR for 15 years. Um, I reached a lot of people. I was a foreign correspondent. Um, I, one news report from Kabul or Delhi, wherever I was, would reach you know, a million, two million, three million people. Um, I left about a dozen years ago to write books. And I reach um, far fewer people with my books. Um, I, still, I reach people, but it's in the thousands, it's not in the millions. But I reach them more deeply. Um, I get letters from readers who say your book literally changed my life, or your book helped me get through a tough patch, your book helped me see things in a new way, thank you, or your book made me laugh. And uh, so I think the answer is, for me is obvious. It's better to reach fewer people more deeply. Um, and that means putting the ego aside. That, you know, or the way we measure life. success. You just You have to rebalance it. I wrestle with that every single day. Um, you know, um, w in the book, in the Socrates chapter, there's a, fr a scene where a friend asked me, what does success look like? And I thought it was actually a very Socratic question because um, it made me stop and think, what does it look like? Not how can I achieve it, which was what all I was thinking, or how can I measure it, or how can I get more of it? Uh, but what does it look like? And um, I think it's really important, hopefully at a younger age, that we come to terms with that question. Otherwise, we'll spend a lot of our life chasing mirages, if you know what I mean. I absolutely know what you mean. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes to go before our we take questions from you. So we're going to do the lightning round. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, what, I'm gonna, what, I'm gonna what, what, what can I win? Do I win something? <laughs> <laughs> you win a signed copy of the Socrates. Experiment. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds great. <laughs> Let's go. So, what I'm going right. to I'm going to state a problem, and then you, Eric, will you'll name a philosopher who might help okay. with the problem, I'll and or yeah. and or share a piece of wisdom. All right. And or share a piece of wisdom. Okay. Yes. You don't have to just name a name, but you got to you have to justify your answer. Okay. But these are one sentence, two sentences, not, not uh, fair. Uh, I'm ready to play. All right. Question number one. Why get out of bed in the morning? Marcus Aurelius, a Roman Stoic, Roman Emperor. And he, you know, he was a very wealthy, rich, powerful guy, but he couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And his ultimate answer to why to get out of bed is other people to be in duty and service to other people, not for yourself. Next question. What is the porcupine's dilemma and is, is it relevant to a pandemic? Picture an evening, it's cold. Porcupines are gathered in a the field. They need each other's heat, so they have to stand close to each other so they don't freeze to death. But if they get too close, someone gets pricked by a needle and they might bleed. So they're constantly negotiating the ideal distance, close enough to survive and have the heat of others and not too close that they die from that, from getting pierced. And I can think of no better metaphor for our pandemic times than that. Just think about how much we need to be close to each other, but if we get too close, we risk demise. It's um, invented by Schopenhauer in the 19th century and absolutely relevant today. Which is why we're talking over a computer instead of in person. So because we are porcupines who don't want to pierce each other. Yeah. <laughs> right. What do we do with an annoying relative? Oh boy. Um, oh God. Um, okay. I would go with Simone Weil, who talked about patience. She was a philosopher in the twentieth century. She wrote about the importance of patience as not a kind of concentration, but a kind of waiting. So I would wait for the annoying relative to get less annoying. I would also throw in a little bit of Thoreau, or Henry David. <laughs> yeah, or die. That, or Henry David Thoreau would also apply because he would say, look at the situation differently. Turn your head upside okay. down. That's look good. at the relative upside down, and they might look better if they're upside down. Okay, next. How do we govern our country? Pass. <laughs> Can't pass on that one. We're all waiting for that one. Oh my god. Oh my god. Um 
Um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, French existentialist, uh, she talked about taking responsibility for your life and your actions, that meaning is not handed to you, that you create it, and democracy is not handed to you, you must create it, that we are the sum of our actions, and if you can think about voting all you want, but if you don't go out and do it, projects, she called them projects, then you're not, you're living it, you're acting in bad faith, as the existentialist said. So Simone de Beauvoir. How do we fight for social justice? How we fight for, so oh, that's easy, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, um, who thought that uh, he was the original good trouble person, and I'm sure that's where John Lewis got the idea, if not the phrase from, he was a student of Gandhi's, that you have to get in the face of your adversary, not your enemy, because you don't have enemies, and you have to make your presence known, but completely nonviolently, and that's the best way to, not only to take the high road, but get results. Next. How to react to a negative book review? Oh, well, gee, I, if I ever got it. If you had one. <laughs> um, I am going to go back to Gandhi, who said that never let somebody else walk through your mind with their dirty feet. That's great. So and he said, and again, this is a paraphrase here, that nobody can harm you without your permission. So I would tell that reviewer they cannot harm me without my permission. I love that you talked about Gandhi as a fighter, that he, yeah. he, we tend to think of him as passive, I guess, but you talk about that's a way of fighting. And he hated the term passive and passive yeah. resistance, and he hated cowardice. Yeah, no, he was... He was an in-your-face, good-trouble kind of guy. Best philosopher for a young person? Nietzsche's pretty good for teenagers and young adults because he's just, he's the philosopher, exclamation points. He's got them all over the page. Sometimes he'll string together three or four exclamation points, and he's just, he's visceral, and he's the philosopher of the viscera, and he's spontaneous. And he walked away from a, a tenured professorship at a prestigious university. So teenager, yeah, definitely Nietzsche. Uh, is there a Mars and Venus philosophy? Is do, do women and men need different philosophers? No. Next question. What is happiness? Ah. Happiness is Something, uh, says the guy who wrote a book about happiness, uh, <laughs> happiness, happiness is not something you should pursue. Um, happiness is a byproduct for a life lived well. The English philosopher John Stuart Mill said that uh, happiness should be approached sideways like a crap. And increasingly, I believe that to be true. That is, it, it, And in fact, that happiness is not enough. That it's really a rich, meaningful life, a wise life that we want, and not a happy one. And that's why I find philosophy actually so much more useful than a lot of the, the pop psychology out there. Is an absence of pain enough? You're channeling Epicurus who said yes, an absence of pain was really all that mattered. I don't know. And by the way, it's good to say I don't know if you're a philosopher. I, I, I'm trying that one on. Um, I, I'm coming around to it that 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 Happiness is not a presence of anything, but nearly an absence of suffering and absence of pain. Because increasingly when people ask me what I want out of life, my response is not a brand new Tesla or whatever, but it's um, peace of mind. And that is, you know, absence of pain. Not a small thing. No, not. Who is the philosopher of Hallmark Cards and Hollywood tearjerkers? That would be Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the philosopher of the heart who was always in touch with his beating, palpitating, violent heart. Um, he was the philosopher of feeling at a time in the 18th century, in the age of reason, when that was not the thing to do. Um, and he gave us the first tell-all confessional called The Confessions. And um, he wrote about the importance of, he elevated feelings to on par with reason. And, uh, and the imagination in particular and um, we have become Hallmark cards and tearjerkers, but I still think that Rousseau was onto something, so yes.
How does a couple stay married? Going back to Gandhi, by fighting regularly and fighting <laughs> well. No, seriously, and, and yeah. fighting well. I mean, Gandhi would, would not trust a couple that uh, never fights. He would say that something's wrong. Gandhi thought that fighting constructively and productively would be uh, an, um, crucial for a relationship. And, uh, and there are all kinds of disputes are natural. And in fact, Gandhi would say it's good that they're coming out. It's a way of finding the truth together. So yes, fighting constructively and nonviolently too. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, what is the most philosophical movie ever made? Groundhog Day by a mile, absolutely. Most philosophical work of fiction, possibly too. I I, I love that movie. Uh, read the book. Why I love it, but it's um, it, it it's Nietzsche's eternal recurrence uh, for the big screen. Yes. Why do we create? You're you're asking. Okay, you're asking some really tough questions. Um, this is the lightning round. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm being struck by lightning. Where's the thunder? <laughs> we create in order to transform suffering. Yeah. All right, three more. And then Donna's going to go to the, the harder questions from the audience. Oh, boy. All right, three more. How do we raise our children? Socratically engaging them in dialogue, not telling them, but allowing them to discover truths on their own. And taking them along on our work. Oh, yes, yes, and my, yes. Um, and milking their wisdom for all it's worth. <laughs> it's been said a philosopher is a seven-year-old with a bigger brain, and I think there's some truth to that. That sense of wonder that yeah. children have, I mean, a good philosopher has that, and plus more, but a good philosopher never loses that sense of wonder. What's the cure for writer's block? Taking your internal editor out in the backyard and shooting him or her, <laughs> making, it look, making it look like an accident. Yeah. That's and who's a philosopher for that? Oh, they all are. Um, you know, let's go with Socrates. He never wrote a word, okay? <laughs> but we're talking about him. And he's on the cover of my book and many other books, in fact, too. Um, Socrates didn't trust the written word, you know, uh, well, Plato, really, but through the voice of Socrates. He thought that, um, that we do best through oral storytelling and that the written word, would, our memory would deteriorate. Um, so... Um, they all, even if they, whether they wrote something or not, they got their ideas out there. A philosopher who had that conversation with himself or herself that I was talking about, but never had a conversation with anyone else, would be an invisible philosopher. We wouldn't know them. So all of them, all 14, whether they wrote something or not, or simply taught others, they shared their ideas. And um, that willingness to share and that willingness to be laughed at and ridiculed and not care because a lot of these philosophers were ridiculed. Look, they were not successful in their day with very few exceptions. Um, Nietzsche had to pay the printing costs of a lot of his books. Um, Schopenhauer achieved just a little smidgen of fame toward the end of his life, the comedy of my fame, he said. So, and they kept going. And this is what, what, I, what inspires me is they they weren't checking their Amazon ranking every hour. You know, how's my book doing? Right. And so they had some sort of internal GPS that kept them going. And um, I wish I had more of that because it, it's, but just talking about it is giving me the courage to keep going. So good. Okay. All right. Last one. Last question okay. in the lightning round. And then okay. we're going to go to the audience questions. Okay. Last question. Okay. Kale salad, kale salad or cheeseburger yeah. and fries. I'm going to say cheeseburger and fries, even though I'm a fishitarian. <laughs> okay. um, I just okay, think sea bass, uh, kale salad or sea bass. 
sea bass. He just wants something. He wants some meat there, whether it's who's fish or burger. Who's our philosopher of meaty meals? Meaty meals. It's actually, it's Epicurus, but not the way people think. People think um, that Epicurus was about, you know, gourmet food, but really he was just about simple food, but enjoying it. So it didn't matter how you made the sea bass, just as long as you enjoyed it and enjoyed it with, with friends. Um, and uh, the existentialist would wash it down with a few bottles of wine. So, yeah. A few. All right, Donna, it's, think, uh, it's all yours. I I'm out. He won the lightning fun. round with flying colors. Great job. Yeah, that was fun. I either won the lightning round or... Yep, won. you did. Okay. Take it to the bank. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, um, I hope these are easier, but we have a question. Um, where were... Oh. Were there any specific reasons Kierkegaard didn't make the cut? I, yeah, I just, I feel bad. I feel bad about Kierkegaard. Um, but um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find that connection. So each one of the chapters in, in this book is a how, begins with a how-to question. The title of the chapter is how to get out of bed like Marcus Aurelius, how to wonder like Socrates, how to see like Thoreau, how to cope like the Stoics. I couldn't hone in on that one how-to question. Um, like Kierkegaard did. It might have been how to have a leap of faith, and he coined the phrase leap of faith, but it, it just wasn't speaking to me, and I wanted to stay true to the book, which is, um, you know, they've got, they, it, it's got to be working for me, and you have to be willing to, to leave something behind that's not coming together. So, yeah. Okay. And um, Pamela is, uh, um, says she loves the way you explain things and she wants you to explain yep. the difference in ethics versus morals. And if you, um, who would you recommend reading to better understand both ethics and morals? Wow. Well, ethics, as I understand it, in the uh, philosophical sense, in the original sense as it was used in ancient Greece, was really uh, the study of and the practice of the good life. It would include things like pleasure and happiness. Happiness was definitely part of ethics. Um, and now they're used to, it's used to more or less synonymously with morals, you know, moral behavior, ethical behavior. We think of them as almost the same, although ethical behavior is a little more societal and moral is a little more internal. Um, the kind of philosophy I write about is actually ethics, but it's ethics in the original sense. I write very little about morality of, you know, the trolley problem, probably be the best example of moral philosophy, you know, that famous problem. If you've watched the show, The Good Place, you know about this too, is this a trolley coming down to you? It's, it's going to kill five people. You can redirect it to kill just one person. And what do you do? That's basically it. Um, that's moral philosophy. Um, a contemporary philosopher who's good on both ethics and morals is, is Peter Singer, uh, who you may have heard of, who, who comes to mind. Uh, Martha Nussbaum is another excellent contemporary philosopher. Um, the reason you may not know these names is not that they're not brilliant, it's just that we don't, we don't hold philosophy in the same regard that the ancient Greeks and even the Romans did. But those would be two, two writers I would start with. Other questions? Okay, sure. Um, so this one um, is, with our heightened climate of racism, sexism, and any other isms where injustice exists, um, can philosophy provide any insight or understanding? Yes, in the, in the sense that uh, at the root of philosophy, and this is Socrates' idea, is questioning assumptions. Socrates thought, we, all these people in Athens, they have all these assumptions. They don't even know they have them. Um, so is, I mean, sort of talking about um, implicit bias, um, sort of, but it's more than that. We all have assumptions, and part of that is assumptions about people of a different color, a different race, different gender, um, but it goes beyond that, and, and you're not going to make any progress, I think, as a person or as a society if people are not willing to question their assumptions. That's just like, that's step one, and I think philosophy can help in that regard. Okay. Um, so we have one more, and this one is from an academic philosopher, Ronald F. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> so he says, throughout your conversation, you have emphasized the importance of place while personally using 
um, the express concept in the title of your book. Was Socrates limited in his pursuit of wisdom by his attachment to Athens? Oh, it's a good question. He was attached to Athens. He loved the city. He died in the city. Um, yeah, we're all, we're all limited by place, and by place I mean culture. So my theory about culture is it's, it's like, um, it's like a, fish, a goldfish being in a fishbowl. The goldfish doesn't know it's in the fishbowl unless you take it out, and then it sees, oh, that's a fishbowl. I was in there, and, and then it re-enters the fishbowl and sees it new. Um, so Socrates, as brilliant as he was, was still an Athenian and still had certain prejudices. Um, and, and he probably, you know, would have benefited by a trip to India, you know, and there was some back and forth. He didn't go, but uh, there wasn't uh, a new age section in bookstores back then, but he, he probably would have benefited. He probably, long way of answering the question is yes, he was somewhat limited by being in that one place. He was not a traveler. Okay, um, we have another one. As a um, Heraclitian, um, I wonder if you can talk about the pre-Socratics. Yeah, so Heraclitus was a pre-Socratic who famously said, all is flux, that nothing, is, nothing stays the same. And, and that's the thing is that Socrates was not the first philosopher. There was uh, Heraclitus, Heraclitus, a bunch of Clytuses, and um, lots of them. And, um, and what, so why, why do we even talk about pre-Socratics? I mean, that would be like people a thousand years from now saying there were the Peter's philosophers and the pre-Peters, whoever came before Peter Copeland, you know. I mean, it, why, why that sharp break? And it's really, I think, because the pre-Socratics were interested in, in the questions of, you know, what was the universe made of? Um, Daly's thought it was all water, interesting idea, but okay, got that wrong. Um, they had theories about atoms, actually, like Democritus. They had all these ideas about what we would today call science. But Socrates was the first one to ask the how and the why questions. Like, how can we lead a better life? Like, how does this apply to us? He wasn't really interested in all those pre-Socratic questions. Um, so that's why I start with Socrates and not with any of the pre-Socratics, because he starts where I want to start, with that, that, that how-to element of philosophy, that aspect of it. Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, so we have time for one more. And um, this is um, from a philosophical perspective. Is religion necessary in our society? Religion is not necessary, but it's not unnecessary. How's that for a philosophical answer? Um, I think that wisdom is necessary, OK? Wisdom is absolutely necessary. And there are different roads to wisdom. I absolutely think that religion is one road to wisdom. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, and, but philosophy, as I discovered, is definitely another road to wisdom. So I would not deny people, uh, certainly, the religion road to wisdom. But I would not say it's absolutely necessary. How's that for a philosophical answer? Yeah. That works. Um, thank you. And I, um, I, I really thank enjoyed you. this conversation. And I, I just want to turn it back over to Zach. Um, so he will do the final. But thank you, Peter. Thank you, um, Eric. I thank you, Peter. Nice job, Eric. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Great questions. Thank you. I'll be waiting for my gift in the, in the mail. <laughs> <laughs>